Good evening. That was really an awesome presentation by Dr. Febreze. I'm not sure I can uh, do an awesome job of following up, but I will do my best. Um, I'm working at the uh, geochemistry department at RPI to investigate some cerium and europium anomalies um, across a mantle zircon. Uh, so to start off, what is a zircon? Um, it's ZrSiO4 is the uh, chemical compound. It's a mineral uh, that is super robust. We love them at RPI in the geochem department because they're super physically and chemically robust. So it's really hard to bust up a zircon. They can take a lot of wear and tear and um, they can survive a really long time. And they can do that uh, chemically as well. They're pretty inert, so they don't react with a lot of stuff. So you can wind up with some really old zircons. I've held a 4.4 billion year old zircon in my hand pretty awesome, and um, they've been, done some really awesome work with that. So I'm going to be using the word zircon a lot in this presentation. Um, oxidation reduction and oxidation state are pretty important as well. Um, so if basically we're going to be talking about this in terms of whether the atmosphere is oxidizing or reducing, or whether the mantle is oxidizing or reducing. So if, the, if it's oxidizing, it means that it's good at oxidizing other compounds. So it's good at um, removing electrons from other compounds. And if it's reducing, it does the opposite. It donates electrons to other compounds. And uh, one final little uh, term, I guess, that I need to define is volcanic outgassing, which is uh, pretty fundamental to this presentation. Um, volcanic outgassing is a method that uh, is prevalent in, um, in studying the formation of the early atmosphere on Earth. So the uh, prevailing theory is that the atmosphere would have been mostly, largely created by volcanoes erupting and spewing gas into the atmosphere. And that gas would be either oxidizing or reducing um, as per the mantle's oxidation state. So the formation of life is a super interesting topic to me. And um, I am going to start ta by talking about the Yuri Miller experiment, which was done in the 50s. And basically, these two scientists took, and I'm sure they had a lot of collaborators, <laughs> took some um, material that was prebiotic that had the right elements to form, like amino acids, nucleotides, and sugars. And um, they put it basically in an isolated system. And uh, they had gases, which were intended to represent the early atmosphere. And um, they then applied a current. So they gave it energy like to simulate a lightning spark or something of the sort. And um, over 20 different amino acids were formed, along with some nucleotides and sugars. So that was pretty groundbreaking at the time. And it um, provided lots of support for the primordial soup theory for the origin of life. And um, that was all uh, well and good. The conditions, were the conditions were reducing, however. So you had stuff like methane and ammonia. Um, and that's all right, except for that when you repeat the experiment with oxidizing conditions, you get significantly fewer acids, sugars, and amino acids. And it's so few that it's to the point that it's really not plausible that um, this sort of theory could be accurate if it would have happened under an oxidizing atmosphere. So the big result of this is that um, it's accepted that for the primordial soup theory to be accurate, um, then it would have had to occur at a time when the Earth's atmosphere was reducing. Um, so when we start talking about a timeline, uh, the Earth's atmosphere was reducing to begin with, and it became oxidized over time. Um, it's believed that it would have been oxidized by, uh, by organisms like cyanobacteria that would have performed photosynthesis and pumped oxygen into the atmosphere. So it's kind of a benchmark for the formation of life. The formation of life is very likely not going to have happened before the Earth's oxidation state became oxidizing. Uh, the atmospheres. So when, we, when you look at old um, material and use it to, to measure the uh, oxidation state of the mantle over time, um, the formation of life would have had to happen before it became oxidizing. So this is where zircons come in. Um, a study done by my mentor and um, several of his colleagues who I worked with over the summer um, did a paper and a study where they found um, that according to some studies of zircons, the oxidation state of the mantle would have become oxidizing, like present day conditions, as early as 4.35 billion years ago. That's a lot earlier than the current um, widely accepted date for the great oxidation event, which is when these cyanobacteria started to make the atmosphere oxidizing. Th that's dated at probably two and a half to three, maybe three and a half billion years ago. So this is a lot earlier than that. Um, so it's a very groundbreaking figure which is why it needs some thorough checking. And um, the experiment was carried out with crustal zircons. 
which presents a little bit of a problem because they don't necessarily reflect the composition of the mantle. This is because they formed in the crust and not the mantle. Um, there was a long digression in the, uh, in the paper that I cited there about why they believe that it's acceptable to use crustal zircons to measure the oxidation state of the mantle, but it definitely is not as sound of a figure if it's not measured with mantle zircons. The problem with using mantle zircons is that mantle conditions include significantly higher temperature and pressure, which means that trends that we like to follow, um, most largely um, to measure temperature of formation, which is required um, to do some calculations that we'd like to do to get a number like 4.35 billion years ago, those trends aren't consistent at such high pressures and temperatures. Um, so that presents one hurdle. And another is that mantle zircons are a lot, I use air quotes, dirtier, um, because they have to come up from the mantle. They have much lower concentrations of trace elements uh, that I would like and the geochemistry department would like to study. So for these reasons, mantle zircons weren't used. Um, my experiment, however, my project, aims to investigate whether or not using mantle zircons with the same techniques is a valid approach. So I invested oxidation state um, through cerium and europium anomaly analysis, which is based on the following principles. Uh, lanthanides, which are a little, uh, you know on the periodic table, that little, those little groups down below the body of the periodic table that should be inserted further up? The lanthanides are the little period that should be in period six. And they can all exist as plus three oxidation states. Um, cerium can exist as plus four as well as plus three, and europium can exist as plus two as well as plus three. So this little caveat allows us to do a lot of investigation into oxidation state for the following reasons. Cerium 4 plus is vastly more compatible in Zircon's crystal lattice than Cerium 3 plus is, um, which means that it basically fits better due to its charge and its size. Um, and Europium 3 plus straight up does not incorporate well into Zircon. So this means that um, in an oxidized melt, you will have very high cerium concentration relative to the other lanthanides and very low europium concentration because you'll have oxidized cerium, which fits well, and you will have oxidized europium, which does not fit well. So this should create a cerium spike and a europium depression um, relative to the other lanthanides. So the first thing that I had to do, which I spent most of last summer doing, was preparing a mantle zircon for experimentation. I had to polish it, I had to mount it so that I could put it into the machine I was going to use. There was, I had to take pictures of it. Um, so that was kind of chores. Um, and then the fun part was where I got to analyze it with a laser. So the LAICPMS stands for the Laser Ablation Inductively Coupled Plasma Mass Spectrometer. Um, the right side there is the laser ablation machine where you insert the sample, you use some computers. If you were standing in the room, they would be off to the right there. It's kind of like Star Trek. You got like four different computers. And um, you can use them to aim the laser. And then there's a little fire button you press. You set the frequency. And uh, they shoot blasts into the laser, little divots. And it puffs up dust from the sample. Helium gas is flowing through the chamber that you otherwise vacuum chamber that the zircon is in. And um, the material flows through. Um, carried by the helium into the other part of the machine, which is the ICPMS, wherein the sample and the helium gas is um, brought through an argon plasma and stripped of its electrons, and then is sorted by mass and charge by a mass spectrometer. That is a picture of my zircon after um, testing. I thought it was cool because you can see the divots from the machine. The ones on the right are 60 micrometers in diameter, and the ones on the left are 30. Um, so the LICP, the LI, the LAICPMS returned um, information in counts per second, but I wanted it in parts per million, so I had to use a different software to um, compress the data into useful units. And uh, then I'm going to explain this because I'm about to show some graphs, but the y-axis on the graphs is C over chondrite, which is confusing, but really it's not that complicated. It's just a relative way to compare the concentration of the um, elements of the lanthanides to each other because they don't all fit equally well in zircon. Um, so it wouldn't be a very easy graph to qualitatively understand um, if it was just straight up concentration. So we divide it by the concentration in the bulk silicate earth, which is like basically average parts per million value in the crust, um, at, which was established by uh, other scientists. And um, so that gives a relative comparison. So here's our standard, which was given to us by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's a standard zircon. So you can see element 58 is cerium, and element 63 is europium. So you can see it should look like a smooth, kind of maybe a log curve. Um, and the axis, the y-axis, is a log scale. 
but you can see that the cerium um, point and the europium point are each not um, smoothly part of the curve. One is a spike and one's a depression, and that's exactly what we want to see. Um, so here are some graphs. I just picked some random ones because they all show the cerium anomaly, um, which, do, which show that spike in element 58. Um, it's, that was really encouraging. Like when we first pulled these graphs up on the computer, um, the, the grad student I was working with and I were really excited because we didn't really expect uh, the trace element concentrations to be high enough to get usable data. But we got a very nice curve, which looks pretty logarithmic and has these spikes of um, cerium anomalies. The, some of them also had this europium depression, which was super encouraging. Um, you can see, uh, I just circled element 63, and you can see it definitely is a de depression in europium. Some of the graphs, however, don't show that. Uh, and this is a little bit of a problem. It's not terribly concerning, but it, because a lot of the samples do show a europium depression and a cerium anomaly, but I definitely don't understand why um, seemingly randomly throughout the um, measurements, we do get these graphs that don't show a europium depression. So that's something to uh, look into in the future. Speaking of which, um, we, I'm going to further investigate the conditional absence of the European depression, meaning I'm going to look at reasons that that could be. One of the reasons that we thought of that um, the grad student suggested to me was that it could be that across the grain there's like a marked change in, um, a mar it will markedly change in like uh, like it, it'll look like almost a different crystal and so that it could have different properties and so I graphed um, I didn't actually include it because I just thought to tell you about it but um, I graphed the europium anomaly against the trial number because the trial number has moved progressively across the zircon and didn't see any correlation there so I don't think that's why but I'm definitely going to do some more investigation um, into that over this summer the second thing that I want to do is find the age of the zircon I don't really know it we do know that it's almost certainly not older than the great oxidation event, meaning that we should see information like we do with, with cerium anomalies and some europium depressions. But I would really just like to give myself some context in uh, when it might have formed. Um, and then the third thing that I need to do is examine more mantle zircons, because so far my sample size is one. And in science, we like a sample size a little bigger than one, but uh, the project isn't quite done yet. I have another summer to do re research, so um, I'm hoping to have more um, samples when I'm done. Thank you. Any questions?